Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Catherine and I'm an adult services librarian at Portage District Library. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this special virtual local author spotlight of Hedy Habra and her poetry collection, The Taste of the Earth. Before we get started, a couple of announcements. We have a large audience tonight. So we are using a webinar format so you'll be able to see and hear the author clearly. Although you will not see yourself on the screen, there are two ways you can interact and ask questions. You may type a comment or question in the chat box, or you may click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. This will allow the moderator to call you by name and share your question or comment with your device's audio. However, I will ask you save the raise hand option for our question and answer session following the reading. You may type comments or questions into the chat box throughout the program and I will collect them for the author during the question and answer section that will follow the reading. Now, without further ado, please allow me to give a warm welcome to our talented local author, Hedy Hopra. Hello. Dr. Hello. I will uh, finish telling you all about her accolades here. Dr. Hedy Habra is of Lebanese origin. She was born and raised in Hilopolis, Egypt, and has lived in both countries. She's a poet, artist, and essayist. She received a BS in pharmacy from the Faculty Francaise de Médecine at de Pharmacie in Beirut. After spending several months in Athens, Greece, and residing six years in Brussels, Belgium, she came to Kalamazoo, Michigan. She earned an MA and an MFA in English and an MA and PhD in Spanish literature, all from Western Michigan University, where she has been teaching. She also taught several years at Kalamazoo College. Hedy Habra is the author of three full-fledged collections of poetry, most recently, The Taste of the Earth, winner of the 2020 Silver Nautilus Book Award, honorable mention for the Eric Hoffer Book Award, shortlist honoree for the Eric Hoffer Grand Prix in all genres, and finalist for Best Book Award. Hoffer was a 14-time nominee for a Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net Anthology. She was recently recognized amongst 10 remarkable women in Arab American prose. Her work was translated into Arabic, Chinese, and Turkish. Um, with all of that, she also has a passion for painting and languages. She's fluent in French, Arabic, English, Spanish, and Italian. Um, and for the past several years, she's been studying Mandarin Chinese and Chinese ink brush painting at WMU's Confucius Institute, as well as practicing Tai Chi. Tonight, she will be reading from her award-winning poetry collection, The Taste of the Earth. The poems in The Taste of the Earth weave together personal history with the complex cultural heritage of the author's countries of origin. Such images linger in the mind and keep evolving in search for the permanence of beauty within suffering as they are evoked by trees, houses, fountains, and familiar objects, each voice offering with its testimony a broader perspective on the interconnectedness of worlds and universality of emotions. And although I've read many of the poems in this collection, I'm delighted to hear more. Welcome officially, and thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks so much, uh, Catherine. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I'd like to thank the Portage uh, District Library and uh, yourself for hosting me tonight, and to thank all the participants who uh, took time from our tense uh, times and tense moments to come and take a nice, uh, I hope a nice poetry uh, uh, interlude. So um, since you've uh, talked about my background, I'll let then the poems talk for themselves. Uh, so since this, this collection is really a memoir in poetry in poems, and um, I've tried in it to uh, go back to roots, origins, um, whether linguistic or uh, cultural and uh, explored some of the myths. So I'll start, uh, I'd like to start my reading uh, 
with um, the title poem, it's uh, The Taste of the Earth. Two fawns cross the creek. One of them pauses, linked to his mirror reflection by the tip of his tongue. Parallel worlds merge on the fault line of a folded image. A musical phrase sticks to your skin. The wind espouses ripples. Liquid dunes lick the shoreline, give moisture to wild brush, blown over seeds and thoughts. Iridescent hummingbirds hover over purple iris blooms. The shore is faithful to the stream's first touch. Like first love, it nourishes tendrils rising into a green flame, never forgotten like the taste of the earth. A desert thirsts for an oasis. A fawn melts into the music of a fable, a gazelle. New memories map rhizomes, twisting, anchoring us farther with each shoot, spreading from our birthplace to everywhere we've lived, to where we live now. And does it make a difference if the root remembers? The next poem I'll read is uh, titled, I Always Knew I Was a Sibyl at Heart. I have paid my dues and fought mood swings before entering that stage of well-earned wisdom, preventing me from climbing over walls in midday, pacing interminable labyrinthine pathways or drowning in the deep wells of insomnia. I've collected enough books to keep me company till the day I die, stacked in double and triple rows in an arbitrary order they refute in unison. Each volume stares at me with eyes shut, scrutinizes my movements, tries to lure me into caressing its spine, opening it like an eye chink. Shouldn't I, on account of my years, be granted the sight, recognize the rhythm of unspoken speech in the folds of each palm, read the veins of each leaf blown by the wind, I could be scrying in the moonlight, eyes wide open like a wise owl, sensing the slightest reflection on still water. The entire collection weaves poems about memory and many poems are from the point of view of objects or trees, plants. I'd like to read one titled uh, Once Upon a Time, an Olive Tree. And this poem is from the perspective of the olive tree. My elders were chopped down and burned. Their roots too deep to uproot, their veins spread, shoots spoke in tongues, mapping the field, an invisible presence throbbing under the earth. Thirsting for each raindrop, remembering every bird's trill and nest, the air redolent with blossoms, the smell of grilled skewers, baking stones, freshly roasted coffee, feet stomping the earth with joy, a rhythm of life inscribed in every pore. Will children ever know how much I miss their branches? Lacy shadow woven with stories and wisdom. The book has five sections and the uh, second section is an abecedarian. It's titled uh, Meditations Over Phoenician Letters. It's a very long section and each um, Phoenician letter has um, inspired a poem and there are uh, illustrations of every single uh, Phoenician letter and the the name of each of these letters uh, has a, an echo in Arabic. And that's what, what really inspired me to write these very short poems. So I'll read uh, a couple. Gimel, 
for camel, ships of the desert, El Gamel, battling dunes and waves head bent, back curved under chests filled with gold and spices, eyelids heavy with the secrets of Tombuktu. Dalit, for door, half open, dal, hospitality, leading to Eldar, a heart with open valves to transfuse friendship, erase boundaries, esteeming Stu's sense, welcoming you in. I'll read one more. Yod for yed, a hand for lovers hand in hand, for building, cooking, painting, hand shaken in a peace agreement, asking for a daughter's hand, granting her hand, would a girl's hand always belong to a man? So these, um, this whole section uh, about the Phoenician letters uh, precedes an entire section of the book about Lebanon, the civil war. We left uh, Lebanon at the onset of the civil war that was to uh, last for 15 years. And there are a few poems here uh, about some of the, those recollections but also um, poems about my going back to Lebanon 25 years later. So um, I'll read part of a long poem titled The Map of Memory. Dec decades later, I no longer find my bearings, highways crisscross a city once mine in the map of memory a needed erasure after 15 years of madness, an amnesic reconstruction, sweeping dreams from stones, removing scars from facades, remodeling features, balconies laced with wrought iron, windows graced with a triple arch, doorways heavy with footsteps, all long gone with the echo of voices. And the next poem is titled, uh, After 25 Years. We only went back after 25 years. After 15 years, the reconstruction lasted several years. And then we were taken by other obligations and we couldn't go back. And we only went back when we felt it was safe. So the, um, there were lots of new buildings and um, I will just let the poem speak for itself. After 25 years, I came to Beirut to retrace my steps, but its warmth enveloped me in its ample mantle through streets I didn't recognize. Mushrooming bridges and roads led me to an array of Phoenician wrought iron letters rising over the Corniche railings like triremes masts. I caught glimpses of an old house's blue mandolin windows, its arcades vivid in my dreams, with its twin sister's face disfigured by open wounds. Here and there, a jogger runs along the promenade. Steeped in lost footsteps, the water seems darker as though hiding painful memories. Only the vendor of crisp sesame breads makes me feel at home. With a smile, he fills my cack with fragrant za'atar. We won't linger in a cafe to sense the sea's mist suffused with bitterness, hear the stories of the wind. Instead, we go to the new Fridays. I wish I'd pace the streets to gather some crumbs of what I miss the most, the traces of a city hiding within a city, hidden, under my eyelids. This is not what the heart remembers, I say to myself, until the jacaranda's blue light anchors me back, whispering, yes, it's here, deep inside, fluttering like a dove's wing. When uh, we left uh, Lebanon at the onset of the civil war, there was only one way to the airport and we had to cross a very dangerous bridge. 
Uh, and um, I wrote a poem titled Vanishing Point that is really an ekphrastic poem that was inspired by a surreal painting by Juanita Guccione. The painting is titled Games of Chance. And upon admiring this uh, painting, I sort of projected myself into it and my memories. So the poem, here's the poem, Vanishing Point. Under a dark moon that has decided to keep silent, I wander along the street of chance, staring at the vanishing point, uncertain of the odds of being, but with the certainty that it leads to the sea. I walk like an automaton among passers-by, gliding as faceless palms. A couple of black horses pound the pavement, wavering between going forward or backward. I wonder what lies for me at the end of this road, lined with lamplights and palm trees. Fan-leaved branches stretch, unfolding an animated deck of cards, turning into murals that grow in size. Shuffled and reshuffled at each step, some cards flip into a hall of mirrors in which I lose myself in my own reflections, as though in an old photo album where the faces of those now buried are fading. We're crossing the bridge of death to leave behind the madness, black sacks stained with blood, stillness, snipers, a heart skips a beat. I walk faster, look sideways, some things are best forgotten. Let's fold the night into light. I pass a couple of young men who seem to get closer to me, then recede and peel off the murals, disintegrate like antique parchments at the sight of an imposing woman in tyrant purple, a younger version of my mother who takes me by the hand and whispers in my ear, there isn't a minute to lose. The fourth section is titled Meditations over the Eye of Horus. It's the longest section in the book. And um, it is uh, inspired by the Eye of Horus, which is an amulet that was uh, considered extremely uh, important and symbolic by the ancient Egyptians. And that's why I chose to paint the eye of Horus on the cover of the taste of the earth. Uh, I read the title uh, poem, The Taste of the Earth, and I titled the book, The Taste of the Earth, because the entire uh, collection is revolving around the senses. And the long poem titled Meditations over um, the Eye of Horus has also illustrations because each part, each physical part of the eye symbolized one of the six senses for the ancient Egyptians. In this very long section, uh, there are poems, hybons, which are prose poems followed by a haiku. See a series of hybon for each sense, and, uh, and the last stanza is a series of incantations or laments uh, revolving around that specific sense. So what uh, I've tried to do in that section is uh, go back to the rituals of ancient Egypt and juxtapose them to personal memories that seem to have some uh, similarities and parallels. But the memories in that section are not only memories from Egypt. They are mem really memories and recollection from uh, all over the places. So uh, I'd like to read just some excerpts. I'll read one excerpt from the section dedicated to smell. My friend Mona would bring to class her boyfriend's handkerchief soaked in Old Spice. Shem, the deferred touch of a lover's approach. Or else, how could the pungent smell of a coat 
hanging on a hook, reeking of frying emanations, cause a body to ache with longing? And wasn't it during his Egyptian campaign that Napoleon wrote to Josephine, begging her not to bathe as he was on his way? Have we lost the animal? My cat sniffs dirty socks and underwear, mouth agape with a mesmerized stare. I knew each of my baby's smell. The skin remembers the scent of essential oils, an invisible presence. So with the, these meditations, aside from the illustrations, I have used uh, Arabic script and also uh, Arabic words. The next uh, excerpt I'm gonna read from Meditations Over the Eye of Horus is dedicated to the sense of sight. Basar. Basar is sight in Arabic. This is the pupil of the wajet. It represents seeing or the sensation of light. In the nobleman Padishu's tomb, the wajet is endowed with a hand holding a pot with flaming tapers. A god's eye bearing light, guiding the hand as it carves and paints symbols on the vault's walls. Lush everyday scenes to carry along into the afterlife. In Heliopolis, our house was wallpapered with my mother's oils. Windows, thresholds inviting me to step inside near the girl seated in a boat, a young man eating her up with his eyes under the elderly fisherman's frown, or follow the couple watching the sunset from a terrace. Their silent message reached me deeper year after year. The Book of the Dead spells on papyri or over murals ensured the path to eternal life. And aren't churches open books covered with sacred eyes, staring at the faithful, piercing their hearts with invisible arrows? And don't colors and figures speak in tongues like Dante's Visibile Parlare, the bar reliefs paving the way to expiation in his Purgatorio? Uh, I guess I have time to read a couple of more uh, senses. I'll read one excerpt from the sense of thought. Thought in Arabic is fakr, fikr. And it is symbolized by the eyebrow. My mother's perfectly traced eyebrows punctuated her mute directives in a secret language that controlled our pulse. When she'd say, Elbi kash zayil zibiba, you have shrunk my heart into a raisin, we fear the next step, that of erasure, with the sempiternal, the wepti elbi, you have melted my heart, as sugar dissolves in water. Ancient Egyptians believed the heart to be the seat of consciousness and wisdom. At the final judgment, it was weighed against Matt's ostrich feather to allow the deceased to cross the pathway to the field of reeds. Is this where from we get our sense of love in connection with the heart? Does a thought espouse the rhythm of a heartbeat? When we forgive, don't we feel our heart lighter, freed from the ballast of bitterness and resentment. I guess I'll just read one last part dedicated to the sense of hearing. Priests touch the mummy's lips during the opening of the mouth ceremony. In turn, the deceased could utter spells to regain power. We'd learn poems by heart, Zayil Bulbul, as a nightingale. The Hakawatis strung stories hour long in cafes in midst of Shisha's whirling volutes of smoke. 
tellers of lies that became truths, like the making of history. Did Shehrazad's grain of voice entrance Shehrayar? Cleopatra must have had a velvety voice in each and every language, for her tongue was an instrument of many strings, or so says Plutarch. Do mute voices hover over burial sites? Ask the 500,000 inhabitants of Cairo's mausoleums. Are voices absorbed through kissing? Isn't love making an opening of the mouth ritual to make a lover's voice endure? Your laughter still rings in my dreams. Through thick walls, Lila could still hear her estranged kais, or Majnun the madman, reciting love poems in the desert. With eyes closed, she'd see him mark his longing with a stick on the sand's skin, each verse enfolding the letters of her name, L-A-Y-L-A-N-I-G-H. T. Orpheus's head and lyre floated on the river, still singing mournful songs. And the last uh, section takes us back to uh, the aftermath of violence in the Middle East. They are meditations from the point of view of a jug or a house. And also these are poems about the hopes during the Arab Spring. So I'll read a poem titled, I'd like to write a song of freedom. And that refers to 2011. That's when the poem was written and that's when all those hopes were really uh, heightened and then later on crushed. I'd like to write a song of freedom the daily news defies me, as does the almanac. When early signs of spring sprout in Egypt and Lebanon, budding with innocence, walls rise, crushing voices with indifference. I'd like to write a song of freedom, a song of songs merging the dialects of my youth into one heart and share the lush ruby red arils of Phoenician apples. Syllables fall off the table, lie formless all over the floor, powerless, unable to unite. How could they concoct an elixir of hope when time and again in the land of milk and honey, fear settles its motto in streets steeped in carmine ink, where shades wander, forever haunting the sight of their bloodshed. Unable to decipher the elusive pattern of unuttered words cluttered between my temples, a heavy armor pressed against my chest. I only feel the lift and pause of the waves surrounding silence. Will I ever learn the language of invisible scars tattooed all over my skin? And the last poem from The Taste of the Earth will be dedicated to the house in Aleppo that I would never get to see. And uh, this poem is inspired by photographs. My father's uh, great grandparents lived in Iskandarun. They were Armeni of Armenian origin. And they moved uh, to Aleppo where they settled for a very long time before coming to Lebanon where he was born and then they settled in Egypt where I was born. So this um, uh, poem is the house in Aleppo that I would never get to see. My father's ancestral home haunted me for years like the mirage of an oasis that kept receding in my mind. I've lived in this house through stories told by my grandmothers in Heliopolis and yellowed photographs bearing handwritten notes, a dream stored in a drawer, 
Year after year, whenever in Lebanon, we'd say, next time we'll make it to Aleppo. I will never sit in the internal courtyard by the marble fountain inlaid with pink stone and basalt. Watch the rise and fall of its refreshing ferns constantly humming as I sip my Turkish coffee. I will never walk over the intricate geometric designs of the marble floor surrounded by climbing jasmine and rose bushes lending their pungent scent. On sleepless nights, I'd visit the wood paneled rooms, stare at the wall cabinets calligraphic carvings letters engraved in gold leaf arabesques, opening up like petals, each telling a tale. The story of the secret passage leading from the cave to the once imposing citadel, offering the possibility of an escape or reaching out for supplies, alleviating the anxiety of living under constant threat. The story of the cave's arch chambers, redolent with ghost smells and fragrances. The large earthenware jugs pregnant with wine, vinegar, or olive oil. The handmade laurel soap squares stamped with an olive tree and stored to age for months. The story of laurel bar shavings melted for laundry on the terrace, clothes hanging on ropes basking in the sun, nearby the open air stone oven for baking flatbread, braided Easter brioche and pastry trays. I think of the wind blowing through immaculate sheets, shrouding faces, an omen of what was yet to come, the heat of the oven increasing increasing, stone walls crumbling with louder, ever deafening sounds. And I wonder, where did the songbirds go? Thank you. And I don't know if there is time to read a couple of poems from my new collection. So I'll ask Catherine to let me know. I think we have a little bit of time if you would like to. Um, okay, um, then I'll read a couple of short prose poems that are inspired by paintings. And it's part of my new collection that I'm trying to organize right now. And it's been six years in the making. So the, the two, uh, poems I'm going to read are both inspired by the surreal artist Remedios Varos. The first one is inspired by Remedios Varos, Woman Leaving the Psychoanalyst. And the title is, or could I finally be allowed to leave my analyst? I'm leaving his office, his office with my hair standing on end. No iPhone at hand, or else what would have made a great selfie? I walk out with a steady stride, tired of these useless sessions. After all, am I not reconciled with my dark side? No more makeup to hide the once widening circles around my eyes. I'll let the gray show on my temples. Allow my electric hair to rise and curl at will, catching sunlight and moonbeams in its spires. I don't need him anymore, but he doesn't seem to know it. There's still work to be done, he says, wants me back over and over again. I have no more stories to tell, no more foggy areas to recover, forge and weld. Has he become addicted to my voice? Or does he see his own shadow reflected in my dreams? See, this is the story of my life, analyzing instead of being analyzed, entertaining instead of being entertained. And the next poem is also a ecstatic poem inspired by The Vagabond by Remedios Varo. 
And in some ways, I find it um, symbolical during those uh, confinement uh, uh, moments. Or how can I, can we ever cut down to the bare essentials? And this is a persona poem from the point of view of uh, the character in the painting. He kept retreating from room to room, feeling the weight of all the furniture and mementos staring at him like deceased relatives. It was as though the house wrapped layers of time around him, confining him inside a pod about to burst open. For a while, he'd only use his bedroom and the kitchen. He eventually retreated to the sunroom. Its walls lined with bookshelves comforted him as he lay on the wicker couch opposite the bay window. He soon realized he needed fewer meals and only one change of clothes. Feathers seemed to grow out of his bones, filling him with a desire to embrace the movements of the wind. He tried to get rid of plants, of his archived papers, of the photos that couldn't find their place in the abandoned albums. He sorted out the books he knew he'd never read or reread. Finally, the day came when unable to break all ties, he clung to his tabby, the photo of a woman, a purple-lipped Cattleya, a few books, anything he could hide under his strong wings, slammed the door and left. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for that stirring reading. I know we have attendees from all over the world, but here in the US, um, it's of course election time. So it's a very tense time for everyone. And it was wonderful for me to sit back and listen to the pictures you paint with your words. Thank you. Um, yes, we have a hello from Pittsburgh. So we had a couple of questions roll in during the reading and um, I'll get to those in just a moment. Um, but if you do have another question for our author, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, there should be a raise hand button at the bottom of the screen and we'll be able to invite you to um, speak your question for our author. And we have lots of thank yous coming in from our from the people who attended the reading. Thank you. Um, so first question, is there an Arabic translation translated by the author? Of these poems? Uh, of these poems, or I believe Taste of the Earth. No, no, no. But I use Arabic words and Arabic script in the two very long meditations, the meditations of um, over Phoenician letters and meditations over um, the Eye of Horus. But uh, the, I have sh short stories that have been uh, translated into Arabic from uh, my short story collection, Flying Carpets. That's wonderful. So um, moving on to the next question, uh, did you feel like an outsider when you returned to Lebanon? or experience some intercultural conflict? Not an outsider. On the contrary, my heart was bursting with emotion and joy. Uh, I was a little a bit estranged because of the reconstruction. There were some areas that I didn't recognize, some mm -hmm. businesses or maybe a church. Uh, there was a restaurant that used to be across the street from the university. I went to the French university of medicine and pharmacy. This was called the Carabin disappeared. Um, what I uh, lamented was that I was so nicely welcomed by all the friends and relatives that I, it was heartwarming and we were out. They took us out everywhere, outdoors, uh, in their homes, but I never had any moment to walk alone in these streets. And as I say in the poem, to retrace my steps. But I didn't feel estranged. I, you, I only felt estranged to the extent that whenever you leave a country, 
and you spend a lot of time somewhere else, when you go back, you have changed and you can see certain things from a different perspective. In that sense, yes. Yes, there's certainly that moment of returning, whether it's been um, a year or 25 years that just makes you feel um, both welcome to home, but also um, it's just never quite the same again. Um, we have people commenting that they've been reading Flying Carpets and what an amazing work it is. Uh, moving back to our questions, um, your writing style includes both personal story and inspirations from art. How did you discover your style? I, I don't think I ever discovered it. Uh, and I recently read uh, a comment that uh, an author that I greatly admire, Khaled Matawa, wrote in an interview that uh, uh, one of his mentors had told him, never find your voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so whatever that means, I've been pondering that advice. Um, I started writing uh, in French. Uh, I used to write poetry in French. And when I came here, uh, it's been 40 years. Uh, then I started... Uh, you know, studying Spanish and English. And uh, gradually when I got into the MFA in English, I started writing poetry. I switched to English. So, but I was studying uh, Latin American literature. I always never stopped reading French literature, which was my first love because I was schooled in a French school. And so I primarily studied French and then Arabic and then English at school as second and third languages. So I think uh, that um, the influences are, are really uh, so diverse. And when I discovered Latin American literature, I fell in love with Latin American literature and authors. And uh, but so I, I was writing Flying Carpets and Tea in Heliopolis during about maybe 15, 18 years. This, at the same time as I was teaching and getting degrees and raising my kids. So it was a very long process. And uh, at the same time, I was writing, as you say, memories, uh, f trying to, re to find or put together my fragmented self, if you want, or, or trying to get a sense of what was important for me or has been and is still. And so... But at the same time, because of my love for literature, I love also the Italian uh, um, fantastic literature like uh, Calvino and Buzzati and all of the Latin American magic realistic uh, authors. So uh, many times uh, my memories or my writing would translate in a more imaginative way. It wouldn't be, um, it was the emotion that was always there, but it wasn't really necessarily uh, realistic in the sense uh, that it was an image uh, or, or a projection of what I had really experienced. So it, all of these, this was in place. And with time, I kept on writing poems inspired by art. Um, I have a collection. Uh, you had asked me at the beginning of the reading about uh, under brush strokes. I have an entire collection inspired by art. And the two poems I read at the end are inspired by art and I've been writing them for several years. But it seems that even in uh, Teen Heliopolis and The Taste of the Earth, I also have poems inspired by art, by nature, by the visual. So it seems that all of these uh, tendencies uh, are difficult to, uh, they're all, forming a sort of a network. Uh, in any case, maybe a critic will, will be able to disentangle them, not me. Perhaps, I don't think I quite reached the level of the critic, but I certainly enjoy them. Um, and we, we had a lot of responses during your reading about different phrases that really spoke to our listeners tonight. Um, so there's this incredible nuance and depth that you bring to your poems that we all appreciate. Thank you. Um, Thank you. There was a question, I believe, from uh, Susan. 
Um, and she would be interested to know how you thought to entitle these new poems, beginning with or. All of the new poems I, um, that she's working on begin, I believe, with or. So would you like to talk about that? That's a very good question. Um, I'm not sure I have the answer. I know that all of a sudden, uh, the, the new book I'm trying, I'm going to hopefully be able to put together. I already have all the poems that already have been published in journals, but I have to find the motivation and the energy to compile them into, into a manuscript, of course, to keep revising. Uh, some of them don't have titles that begin with or, but at least I would say maybe three dozen. So uh, one day I'll I just started to write poems that seemed to express um, my own doubts. I mean, it, in the same way, by using or, I'm engaging the reader, but I'm also uh, trying to express a certain duality of thought, like, uh, or how can we ever cut down to the bare essentials? So in, in some ways, using the or before seemed very important to me, but maybe I'm not 100% sure of what it means. I have yet to discover. I think it's a wonderful question, Susan. Yes, thank you so much for that question. It just really brings out the magic of writing that not everything has um, a defined uh, answer, but that it comes together in such a beautiful way regardless. Um, another question, uh, you're writing, um, no, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, so how do you decide which poems are included in your different collections? How do you go through that process of weaving together a book? I usually uh, write poems following my inspiration. That's why over the years I've written uh, uh, let's say, personal poems or ekphrastic poems, and I put them in different piles. Uh, but when it came, let's say, to uh, when the time came to, to write The Taste of the Earth, um, I knew that it was from a more mature perspective. Like when I wrote Chin Heliopolis, my first collection, I had just come to the States, although I wrote it during a very long time, 10 years maybe. Uh, because I was doing other things at the same time. At the time in Teen Heliopolis, I was remembering Egypt and Lebanon, the civil war, the losses, uh, trying to have a kind of a medallion of memories and places and identity. But uh, the taste of the earth was written, much, you know, uh, during the past 12 years, so there's a long gap of time. It's a more mature perspective. It's, it was a certain desire to go back to roots and uh, explore all, you know, the origin, the roots, but also a reflection about what's going on in the Middle East, in Egypt and Lebanon. And so the poems automatically during that period uh, had the same focus, but, um, when I started putting them together and I, I knew I had written the meditations over the Phoenician letters a few years ago, and I knew I wanted to write the meditations of the, over the Eye of Horus. But when I started writing that section, it took me more than a year. Mm -hmm. And I was absolutely um, uh, not contrived, but because I had decided to use a specific forms, like four or five hybans followed by a 10 line litany, uh, then automatically it, it became like a project and um, it gave more, I don't know, uh, it fit with the other poems because the other poems had to do with recollections like Proustian recollections that came from the senses but the fact that in meditations over the eye of Horus, they were divided in the six senses. 
uh, gave structure, more structure, I think, to the book. So uh, it seems like it happened naturally. It ha I, I, I don't have any other explanation. It just came naturally. But let's see if I go back to the teen Heliopolis, which, which was my first collection. I had many more poems there, about 20 that I had to take out. And when I put together the taste of the earth, um, I, it underwent several versions. And then at one point, I took out 20 uh, poems. So now I have 20 poems that I took out from this collection and 15 from the other that are in another pile that will be uh, used for eventually uh, another uh, collection of, of personal poems. So for some reason, when I started putting together the taste of the earth, there was a long section of poems that didn't seem to, to fit or that was watering down the collection. Mm -hmm. so it's a long process. It's a very long process. Yes, and you know, your final uh, collection is so beautiful the way it comes together, but I think all of, all of your uh, process really brought the best collection to, to your readers. Okay. So um, you paint all of your covers. Do you have a favorite poetry cover? Out of the ones I made? Out of the ones you made, yes. Well, I think they're like my babies. Each one, I'm attached to every, each one for different reasons. So, but maybe sometimes we're more attached to the latest one. I don't know. Hmm. It's, it's a great one. It's really inspiring. Actually, it's I'm now thinking about the new one that I'm going to paint for my new collection. And so... Yeah, so I'd like to, 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 to paint something that would be appropriate for the, for the new Crestic collection. Well, I know everyone is very excited to see what that's going to be. Um, do you remember writing your first poem? And do you have any thoughts for um, people who may want to try to write poetry for the first time? Oh, I remember my, the comments of my teacher, one of my mentor, which is was Herb Scott, who really encouraged me a lot. And when I started uh, the MFA, as I said, I had been writing in French. And um, the first semester was not, uh, was difficult. And uh, some students in the class really enjoyed my poetry, but he was still hoping to see something different. And one day, one day he said, Wow, Hedy, bravo, you just, you've just written a modern poem. So whatever mm -hmm. I was writing, I was, I was under the influence of Italian, French uh, authors uh, that uh, were maybe foreign to him or, or didn't really fit the canon. And so it took me a long time reading and, and writing and just uh, being persistent until I was able to, to be a little bit freer in my expression. Mm. And, you know, that freedom is something that is really, I think, unique to your work and comes through in nearly all your collections. Um, so one final uh, question here. Where can attendees get your books if they don't already have them? And do you have a website or a social media account where they can follow your upcoming publications? Yes, uh, my son, I was very, very grateful to him. He created a, a, a very comprehensive website where book reviews, interviews, and uh, all the information is present. It's hedihabra.com. And of course, uh, those who live in, in Kalamazoo uh, won't have a problem. Michigan News Agency carries all of my books, so does Kazoo Books. And um, also, um, yes, uh, this is a bookstore. So all the local uh, bookstores, and of course, those who, who live uh, far away from Kalamazoo, can get it from Amazon or from Press 53.
Mm, yes. And all of those, if you are local, all of those bookstores are absolutely wonderful. They each have their own unique flavor. And um, it, I encourage you to check them all out. Uh, before we sign off, you mentioned a new work. Um, tell us a little bit more about when you believe that might be published. Oh, I think it's going to take time because I still have to go through the this whole uh, stage of... Uh, opening up completely my dining room table and organizing all the poems there and you know making all the changes uh, it takes forever and then making the individual revisions for the individual poems uh, it may take months it may take a year i don't know i would like to start i think that if i start uh, I can dedicate a few hours every day, but so far it's been very difficult with uh, all these uh, worries about the pandemic mm -hmm. and uh, other, other concerns. So, and I keep on, you know, trying to uh, write individual poems and keep studying Chinese. So it, it's hard for me to, I procrastinate, but uh, Hopefully, hopefully, I will uh, start working on it because uh, I really feel that when once I start, it, it becomes really um, exciting. It gives me a lot of, uh, I don't know, hope. Uh, I get, I become immersed in it, but maybe I don't, I procrastinate because I know it will require a great investment. I don't know. But who knows, maybe in a few months, it, I'll be able to have something uh, to play with. Yes, well, uh, it really shows the great art that goes into it when you dedicate so much time um, and so much effort. Uh, we had one comment from um, an audience member that said they loved this interlude from the madness of our current world. And I have to agree with them. Um, this was absolutely delightful, and it's a joy to have you as a part of our community. Um, we are honestly so blessed to have such talented local authors. So thank you all for being here tonight, and thank you especially for being here and sharing your poetry with us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, really delighted and very grateful to all of the friends who took the time to be here with us and for all these wonderful questions and for your uh, hosting uh, so wonderfully this uh, reading. Thank you. Well, it was an absolute joy on my end. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Of course, check out hedyhabra.com for all updates on any new poetry or just to reach out and say hi. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you.